What up, what up? It's Neighborhood Nip Puzzle. I'm locked in with my homie Nick on Hard Knock TV. Last time that I ain't ever come check, through fly. Check. No cosign, I ain't need radio to do mine. I done fine, and I take my time. Check. And take my tribe, every level that I crossed in this game. Like state lines, it was visionary. Either I'm genius or you niggas scary. Maybe it's both in this balance I deliver daily. For every nigga in these streets trying to feed the babies. The single mama's working hard not to miss a payment. All right, let's get, get it. Get right into it. Let's get uh, it. I always like to start it with, um, if there was a movie about your life, and the opening scene is kind of going through Crenshaw, coming through the front door of your house. Mm -hmm. What are we seeing? What are we hearing? What are we smelling? We seeing um, a family house, you know, like pictures on the um, mantel, you know what I mean? Um, a bed in the living room, a, a, a couch with a rollout bed underneath it. You smelling coffee. Or like cooking, my granny was always cooking. My mom was always cooking. We used to live together. You see in a family house, you know what I mean? And you smelling food. My grandma and my mom was, was chefs. They cooked a lot. What are we hearing? What's playing? Man, uh, you might be hearing the prices right. Granny had that on lock. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Or uh, the radio. My mama played the radio a lot when she cleaned up. You know what I'm saying? So like a jazz station or like a, a R&B, classic R&B station, you know what I mean? You know? Do you remember what your first like musical memories were? I always was around music. I grew up in like the 90s really, was born in 85, so it was death row in LA. You know, like outside you didn't even have to have the CDs, you didn't have to buy it, you just went outside, you could hear it. Mm -hmm. I was five in 1990, you know what I'm saying? So that was what I heard, I was surrounded by rap music. And then I grew up around, you know, my mom and then my sister's father was uh, like a big record collector too, and like Motown stuff. Do you remember at what point you were like, this is what I want to do? That's yeah, yeah, I, I think like, um, really like the Chronic album, when Snoop and Dre had that video and Snoop was in the, um, in the parking lot with Dre yep. and that was dissing Easy. God bless Easy and rest in peace. I didn't even know I was a diss back then, but I forgot the name of the song. But yeah, that record, you know, I'm like, this is tight, you know what I'm saying? And they sound real familiar to me, you know what I'm saying? So that made me like, this the biggest rap out right now. And these niggas sound like, and the video look like outside. It was like, yeah, I could do that. This didn't happen overnight. You've been putting in a lot of work. Uh, yeah. Was there any point in your career where you thought about giving up? Well, yeah, I, I think I done that before I got recognized. I quit and then went back to it and then quit again and then went back to it. I quit rapping and go back to like grinding and try to just focus all about all my energy on just getting money. And then I get to a level of being comfortable and still want to rap and be like, fuck, I'm about to go book a studio or buy some equipment and then fuck with it and then get frustrated for a lot of reasons, whatever the, the learning curve of fucking with music was, whether it was like not having engineers, not having proper equipment, just going through that shit, get frustrated, say fuck this shit, go back to grinding. And I, but I always came back to it too. I was just like, I must really love this shit. You know what I'm saying? I'm, I'm gonna stop quitting. I'm just gonna say whatever I go through, I'm gonna fuck with the music regardless. You know what I'm saying? What, what was that thing that kept you coming back? Was it just the, the hunger to, to want to be heard or what? I don't know. I was like attracted to it. You know what I'm saying? I was just always, I ain't feel as fulfilled, you know what I'm saying, doing anything else as I did when I was making music. And then I was really inspired by music when I listened to other music. And I always was like, you know, I would have said this, you know what I mean? Or I would have done this record like this. This was a tight beat, but so I wanted to like try my hand at it, you know what I'm saying? And then when I did it and I, I heard myself making progress, like getting better. I was like, damn, you know, this. I could, I could do this for 20 years and still have 20 years of improvement to, to make. This is something you can't master. Nobody ever has mastered music. You know what I'm saying? And you could really dive deep into it and just uncover new shit, but not reach the ceiling. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And so that was like interesting to me. Your victory lap is, mm -hmm. is coming out. Mm -hmm. Yeah, man, it's, it's, a, um, it's like a collection of life stories, for real. <clears throat> that's the, that's the, that's like the, the focus is the narrative of the whole project. That's really the focus is just the story that's being told. It's not it's not like a um, beginning to end type of story. It's just a theme, you know what I mean? And represented in different real life scenarios that I put on, on song modes. 
But um, yeah, it's like a collection of my life stories and things that happen that make us being here really like special, you know, and just the the uphill battle mm -hmm. and just the details about what that was, you know. What are some of the the ones that kind of impacted the, the album the most? Can you share those with us? Man, just like my brother burying two hundred thousand in the backyard, you know, and just being disciplined enough to have that cast and just say I'm gonna bury him, start from zero again, and start from zero grinding up and then going back to dig it up and then hundred and some change of that 200 was mill dude mm -hmm. and then us being in the living room with my mom with the blow dryer and everybody blow drying money and my brother having a breakdown not literally but like like you know what i'm saying like man what is you know what the fuck and going through that and seeing like damn niggas took a hundred some thousand dollar loss off mill dude and like had it on the kitchen table and the living room table throughout the whole house, stinking up the house with the blow dryer trying to, you know, salvage the money. And like to put that into one of the songs, you know what I'm saying? And revisit that from this point right here. Right. And just like other things too, I don't want to go overboard and get too many of the, the details, but just like real stories that took place and, and things that we, we reflect on internally and just be like, man, you know, Moments we thought it was a rap, like this is it, we it's over. You know what I'm saying? We fucked up. We made a critical mistake, and you know, bouncing back and getting through it, and coming into other challenges, and then, you know, from a point of like your first album's about to drop, you in a successful position business wise, and then to think about put yourself back in them emotions and feel that again. You know what I'm saying? Knowing now, now we know everything gonna be all right. You know, we didn't write then, but now thinking about it, it's like 2020. So to write about it was therapeutic, and like I thought that was important to, rep to be represented on my first album. I know one of the tracks that stood out uh, <clears throat> yesterday was Blue Laces Two. Yeah, one of the, the third verse. Yeah, you, you stopped it, and you want to make sure everybody yeah, yeah, yeah. Put, put a close ear to what yeah, you were saying. Exactly. Uh, can, can you lend us into to why that verse is important to you? Yeah, I just again, it's another real story that happened. And I and you know, sometimes like being a luxury car, or like a, a penthouse, or like a you know first class flight, or you know in a bomb ass hotel somewhere, and just remember, like man, you know the the complete opposite, you know being on the run from the police or like driving your homie to the hospital, bleeding, just thinking about, you know the struggle really and just the, the the journey and what what we went through in the in the process of trying to get here and uh represent that in the music you know blue aces one is one of my favorite records one of my fans most cherished records i think that i've put out so i wanted to like revisit the record for the album and uh it just happened naturally i didn't intend on speaking on that specific story that's just what I heard when I heard the beat. Uh, Bron premiered the, the Blue Laces 2 track on yeah. socials. Uh, IT also shows you a lot of love. Yeah. Do you feel that your music uh, inspires athletes to train because of there is that, that hustler, the go get it, the, the grind mode? Do you do you feel like a lot of athletes come to you and, and talk to you about like feeling inspired by the music to you know give them that extra fuel? I've noticed that, that specifically athletes react to, to the message. And then also I think like, you know, they come from the same environment. They going through the same struggle. They just, you know, attacking it through their gifts on, on the court or on the field. And we doing it through the art and through the music. So I think that whether it's the message of motivation or just if they apply it to sports or if they apply it to just the pursuit of like becoming better and like, you know, bossing up and being, you know, successful and you like maximizing your potential, you know what I'm saying? And like challenging yourself. I think those themes is in the music and in the message like the marathon. But I, I have noticed that like, yeah, athletes specifically, mm -hmm. you know, reacting or inspired. And likewise, uh, we, we, we sit in the studio and had a, had a playoffs on mute and go, go back and watch classic performances. You know mm -hmm. what I'm saying? And just be like, look at the zone that was in, you know what I'm saying? So definitely, I think we both feed off each other. It's crazy that a player like IT, who to me has got like, he's all heart, you know, he's sure. one of the shortest guys for in the sure. NBA, but he's for all sure. heart. It's crazy that he he was the one relating to the, the underdog, you know. Man, I've been knowing IT since he was in college, man. 
you know, when I used to go to Seattle, he used to come to the shows in Tacoma with Nate Robinson. And that was early supporters, you know, from like the first marathon mixtape. So to see him make his moves in the NBA and, you know what I mean, go give niggas hell last season and just run up his value, you know, I look at his career a lot like I look at mine. And his trajectory, like, you know, he proved himself. And, you know what I mean, he, he wasn't picked, you know what I'm saying? He, he, he made himself valuable, you know what I'm saying, against a lot of odds. And so I, I fuck with IT heavy. What about uh, with Braun? I see you both really doing a lot in the community and doing a lot for, you know, black businesses. Do you guys ever talk about that at all? You just kind of like watch what each one's doing or? Nah, we don't talk about it. And, oh, we haven't. But I think that um, LeBron, you know, he uh, he know his position and he, and he embraces his role from what I see. Mm -hmm. And I try to do the same. You know what I mean? You in a leadership position, you got to embrace it. You in a position to have resources. You got to allocate toward what you believe in. And, and, you know, so I think that we both relate in that respect, you know, but um, we ain't never had no specific convos about it. You know what I'm saying? More so just like, you know, salute, you killing them. You know what I mean? Keep going hard and repping right. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Somebody who's also giving you props for, for black business and just putting down has been K-Dot. Yeah. He, he was on Twitter and, you know, he gave you, you know, a yeah. salute for that. Yeah. But definitely I seen that tweet and, you know, again, man, I've been on Dot since um, the LAX tour with, uh, with Game. You know what I'm saying? And um, that's another uh, person that um, made they so valuable. You know what I'm saying? And put in work and, you know what I mean? Built up what we looking at now. And uh, It's funny, the first interview that we had with you in 2005, I don't know if you remember, because it was a different host back then. It was Davey D. He walked past the he back. He walked past him in the back. Him J-Rock. Yeah, yeah my homeboy Prosper, yeah. yeah. And Top Dog walked past in the back. Yeah. And Robin Hood. Robin Hood out front <laughs> right now. Everybody was, yeah. it was crazy. Yeah, I remember Did that. Did you know them back then? Or yeah, for sure. Kind of the for sure. Time? We was all up and coming in L.A. and just was like running into each other when we'd be in a building. I remember they had a situation at Warner Brothers and we was trying to play music at Warner and so we'd bump into each other in the halls and doing promo on the East Coast, me and J-Rock. You know what I mean? We'd always campaign together, doing songs together and all that, and just watching Top Bill, TDE, and watching Schoolboy and Kendrick and Av, and everybody just go up. It was all, you know, early seeds was planted for that. Even Ali, like Ali mixed the album, you know what I mean? This and one? Yeah, he oh, makes dope. Victory Lap, and oh. he makes the uh, No Pressure Project me and Bino just put out. So uh, it was a long road, a long process, and uh, you know, We've been uh we've been thugging for a minute with each other. There's a song called Dedication on your project. Yeah. Uh that's one of the standouts for me. What can you tell me about that song? Man, just like I think it's a it's a it's it's really a clear expression of what I was trying to say on the album and just as an artist and just what I went through and what I experienced and just like, you know, it took dedication, that's the best word. You know what I mean? And I think that's the best piece of advice I can give anybody is to be dedicated. Yeah, that record came out, happened naturally the way it got wrote. It's just speaking to the process, and you know what I mean? It's a passionate record, you know? Mm -hmm. And it got a dope, dope feature. And uh, I think, like you said, that'll be one of the standouts for sure. Yeah, it's a moment that's special. Oh. It's what happens, stay down, the game bless you. Right. It's what happens, don't fold, the game test you. Hey. If you pass it, you gone, they can't catch you. It's permanent. I bent down, I deserve this shit. For someone who's kind of seen the industry from a lot of different angles, you're able to kind of build your brand without necessarily the traditional tools. It wasn't necessarily radio that built you. It was kind of a ground up. What, what kind of advice would you have to, you know, the young guys right now in the industry who are, who are kind of looking to, to figure out how to create their own lane? Man, honestly, <clears throat> it's hard to just give, like, you know, blanket advice to, like, here's what you should do. But I'll be like, you know, master the craft. You know what I'm saying? After all the strategies wear off and all the approaches, you know what I'm saying, get tried, everybody gonna realize it's about the music. You know what I'm saying? It's about how to, how, how, what level the music vibrate on. Something that you talk a lot about in your rhymes is owning your rhymes, right. owning your masters. Right. Yeah, especially, I mean, streaming right now is, is more important than ever. Just because, like, you know, it's a lot of money in streaming, and especially when you drop a popular project or a big song, if you get the back end of that, you know, that's that's real money. The value of the song over the lifetime of the song, it's hard to even calculate. 
you know what I'm saying? Or when the records is successful and or even just viral and they trending on the mixtape level, that's the, that the streaming turns over. So if you can stay in control, you know, of your masters as long as you can because you will love to have a catalog. That's the best thing I had is that, you know, I got a catalog of, of music that, you know, is streamed every month. And you know what I mean? We involved in that. Mm -hmm. So I got to see it from that level. When everybody's complaining about streaming, I'm like, you know, I don't understand that. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, I see it from a level of like a business who whose products stream. And from that perspective, it's, it look good. If I was just a business and the, the product I was streaming was a different artist, the artist might feel different than I feel because he's seeing the, the streaming from whatever his agreement with the company is. But the actual pot is a nice pot. Right. They're just not getting a big chunk of that pot. Yeah, and you know, it, it, that's all based on how they negotiated. Right. You know what I'm saying? But, you know, it's a nice pot. Mm -hmm. So to own the masters is very critical, you know, if you can. You know, when you, as an artist, until you sign a contract, you own your masters. And even when you do, you know, it's contracts that you can sign where you still own your masters. That's definitely um, the cornerstone to, you know, uh, maximizing the value is try to try to maintain the ownership of the master. Speaking of maximizing value, yeah. you had a line about Ross. Yeah. And you said you appreciate that Ross is teaching wealth. Yeah. You know, I feel like <clears throat> that's what you're supposed to do. You know, you are, I, I look at moves from the outside looking in. The message that, you know, Ross sprinkle in, or even when they don't sprinkle it, say it outright. I think that's the most empowering message right now, you know? So I just, again, all the, all the writing on the album came out natural, but I felt like I wanted to just um, speak to that. We inspired by that as, as the next generation under that era. It's also young kids that's being molded by what's being said in rap music. So, you know, it's a line between preaching and just keeping it a, 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 a thousand and being thorough. And so, yeah, I was just tipping my hat to something I think is thorough. What do you think are the keys to building wealth? Man, I think that it's, it's a formula, and then it's also some things that's intangible. To own something is very important. To understand um, investment, you know, to understand living within your means or under your means, you know, to understand um, how to make something, you know. I think that's, that's what's been critical for me. Is I make something, I take something from zero and I make it, which is music. And that's a very powerful tool to be able to like come into a room and create something out of nothing. And so that's that's worked for me. But then it's people that, you know, master that part of the game but consume so fast that it's hard to even get ahead. So it's a combination of things and I ain't the I ain't the poster boy for it. But at the end of the day, um that's the direction we, we walking toward is, is becoming um, wealthy to the level that it's not going to go away. And that, you know, we create a, we create a situation that it, it lasts longer than us. I've always feel like one of the things I admire about you the most is you're always very forward thinking. Right. You were on a panel at Complex Con. <clears throat> what are some of the, the takeaways that, that you would want people to know about like digital currency? Or it's just, a, it's a way to think about money. It was three or four different perspectives. I was one of them. And the convo is just about um, what is money in 2017 going into 18. You know, is it paper? You know, is it, is it agreed value? What is the, what makes something currency? You know, so that was what the debate was and everybody was revolving around that as a question. But just cryptocurrency is, um, I think it's like a form of karma. I think that the banks had such a crooked model that the engineers and software designers and programmers was like, we're not going to fix this with a protest. We're not going to fix this with a march on Wall Street. We're going to fix this with technology. Mm -hmm. And they created a, a equalizer that just it checkmated the whole game. You know, that's my view on it. Mm -hmm. It's just like the energy balancing out what went wrong over there and just the, the, the disadvantage that the people were at. The cryptocurrencies balancing that out or will in the long run. It's gonna take a while, but it's gonna create an option. And you're not gonna have to go operate 
in that system that led to like 2008, all the banks collapsing in the real estate bubble and all the malpractice of, of power that, you know, was happening in the banking industry and the central banks and all that. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's like, damn, that was slick. Whoever came up with that was slick. If you really peep it from a political point of view, sure. you know what I mean? That was real effortless checkmate. You know what I mean? They exited before anybody knew what was up. Yeah. They still got bailed out. You know what I'm saying? It's crazy. It's a, it's an interesting conversation. I've had it with some people, and you know, some people are like stuck on money so much, and I'm like, man, money's not even backed by the gold system anymore. Yeah. So it's like, what is it really worth? It's whatever right. we, you know, want to put on it, but really, it's just a piece of paper. You know, just like a credit card, just a piece of plastic, and it's the the inferred value that we put on it. And as long as everybody assumes that it's worth that. It is, but if somebody tomorrow's like, that's not worth shit, mm -hmm. it's really not backed by anything. Mm -hmm. So it's like, why not try out a new currency? It's, it's a lot of reasons that, you know, political reasons why it's a big thing and it's financial reasons why it's a big thing, you know, and even like on a simple level of like sending money overseas or something to be able to do that peer to peer and not have no, no middleman with mm -hmm. a fee and with a policy is just a direct transaction that's, you know, regulated by a public ledger. That's a big innovation if you understand like banking and yeah. PayPal and all that type of shit. You know, somebody told me that it's like what the internet was in, in like uh, the early 90s. Mm -hmm. And think about what that turned into and all the billion dollar businesses that was built off of that. That's like what the cryptocurrency blockchain opportunity is similar to. So it would take a while before we see it mature and really turn into what it's potentially it can potentially be. Right, and you're not just talking about it, you actually invested in the company. Yeah, definitely, definitely. Follow coin, it's, it's, a, um, it's a coin and it's also a, uh, it's a utility. You know, and I, I spoke about it and everything. Yeah, but, there's a dope documentary yeah, on YouTube about it. Yeah, definitely. It. Let's get back to the album real quick. Yeah, Puff on some ad libs. Yeah. Why, uh, why was that important to you? You know, I think what Puff represent is like elevated taste, like in terms of like hip hop, like, you know what I mean? From like fashion to music to like business, you know what I mean? Puff taste was always like premier. And so, you know, I just was like, um, it'd be dope. And Puff just known for putting swag on a, on a dope rap record. You know what I'm saying? And so I just wanted to play the album for him. You know what I'm saying? I went by the house and played the album and um, that was the one he fucked with the most. And so I had it in mind for him to get on rap niggas. You know what I'm saying? And get in the video with the mic on. But he like he liked the other record, so he did that one and it was dope. That was a crazy session. You can feel the energy. Yeah. Like, seeing from outside what you're trying to build with the the store and with like the project that you got going on in LA and like all that stuff, I'm like, okay, I, I see the dynasty that he's building. So I was like, maybe, you know, Puff being on the record also means something to him yeah, in terms of... Yeah, definitely. It's the record called Young Niggas. And if you hear it, you know, you, the, the people are here and I think they'll make the connection to why Puff makes sense on that record. Mm -hmm. But yeah, for sure. Puff ran a marathon in real life. You know what I mean? I got I got Puff on the last song on TMC. You know what I mean? Uh, a clip of him in a documentary. Mm -hmm. And um, <clears throat> he represent the self-made you know what I mean? Street mogul. You know what I'm saying? That came up through hip hop. You know what I'm saying? So I got lyrics where I, I, I reference Puff Grind. So yeah, it always we always aspired to do what Puff did. You know what I'm saying? What J and M did and what Snoop and, and, and Dre and them did, you know. So um yeah, definitely one of the blueprints for sure. Pull up in motor cash. I got a show today. It's all I'm trying to do. Hustle and motivate, choppers are throw away, hustle the over way, that's why they follow me, huh, they think I know the way. You called a track yesterday called the Hustle and Motivate Quintessential Knit, mm -hmm. what does that mean to you? Man, I was telling niggas like you can buy a victory lap at Starbucks, you know what I'm saying, you know how they got like three albums at the, the front, mm -hmm. I'm like yeah I feel like this one of them. You know you might have, John Coltrane got a whole catalog of music, but he got one album, he got uh, Love Supreme, you know what I'm saying, at Starbucks. And Adele got the nice catalog, three albums. She got 21, you know what I'm saying? At, you know, so I'm like, this one probably, if you wanted to turn your, 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 your one of your partners on to, to Nip and you wanted to make him a fan, play this one, you know? 
So that's why I was just like, and then on the album, if you want to just skip to one song, you could play that one. I wouldn't recommend skipping it because there's definitely a lot of gems. No, I'm saying it, if you yeah. want to skip to one okay. and just go. Oh, you said yeah, 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 yeah. Right. <laughs> you know, shit. I'm appreciating the whole body of work. I got you. Uh, you posted on Twitter to be overwhelmed and ask what I've got myself into is always a reminder that I'm demanding more for myself than I ever have. Mm -hmm. Can you give us some insight into what was going through your mind and, and what does that mean to you? Just being like pressured, like, like overwhelmed. You know what I'm saying? Like mentally exhausted and you still got a lot of shit to think about and to like make decisions on and like do you know what i'm saying but you know um a lot of times even when you work out your brain your your, your body's a lot stronger than your brain sometimes and you gotta catch your brain up your muscles will be ready to keep going your brain will have its limit you know what i'm saying and be like i can't do no more and then your body will follow suit mm -hmm. but when you can break the mental barriers you'll be you'll notice damn i could do way more i was crazy you know what I'm saying? I had way more in me. So I think that's an example of like feeling like you can't, like you exhausted or you, you about to, you know, you overwhelmed and then being clear that, you know, this is how I feel to be pushing yourself more than you ever had, demanding more. You know, that's just the natural way I feel when you, when you press your line and press yourself to produce more and to be better, you know what I'm saying? Where do you go to when when you feel that way? When you're burned out and you're like, I need that extra energy. Like, is there a particular thing that you do, or or something that kind of like gives you that extra fuel? Man, <clears throat> man, for real, I don't know, bro. Like, you gotta tap in mentally to different places. You know what I mean? But I just, you know, I might leave and come back. Sometime I, I just come back. I just I get my energy straight and come back. You know mm -hmm. what I'm saying? Um, that's probably my secret. I, I always come back. You know what I mean? More than anything. Mm -hmm. If you just today ain't today, and then you you know you want to get it done, but it's not getting done, you just come back. You know what I'm saying? Might leave for an hour and come back. Right. You know what I mean? But sometimes that's all it takes. You just gotta like take the pressure off you thinking about the shit. I'm just thinking in terms of making a song, being in the studio under that pressure of yeah. like creating, you know what I mean? Uh, yeah, I think it, it's no one way to do it. You can smoke some weed, sometimes niggas smoke weed, sometimes, you know what I mean? You go watch a movie, do a whole lot of things to try to just uh, stimulate inspiration, mm -hmm. you know? People do all type of shit, you know what I'm saying, to stimulate inspiration, but you know, the kids are just keep going at it. You know what I'm saying? Keep going at it, keep going at it. Yeah. I'm glad you said the, the step away. Cause sometimes people are like, they see something, they just keep bashing their head through the wall. Sometimes you just gotta take a step back and just reassess things and yeah. come back with a clear mind. Yeah, and people, sometimes you feel like you're giving up when you do that, but that's why it's about the double back. You know what I mean? You take a 30 minute, I be doing weird shit, man. When you make music as a lifestyle, over and over and over, you get into like the, like a uh, obsessed basketball player or coach or something and just go overboard on thinking how to get the most out of this practice or the most out of this game, you know what I'm saying? So you start, you know, leave your phone in the car or, you know what I mean? Like, get yourself, i be putting my phone on 15 minutes and then like, oh, I'm gonna just chill for 15 minutes mm -hmm. and my shit will buzz and that shit help, you know what I'm saying? Just little crazy little, things to be productive, you know what I mean? That it's probably just mental shit you're doing with yourself, you know what I mean? To trick yourself into being productive, but that shit ended up working, you know? Hell yeah. Yeah. Nah, I read uh, 10 Habits of Highly Effective People or some shit, that was definitely one of them. So yeah. you just gotta walk around the room, come yeah. back and sit down, that's yeah. enough to just Working out, out, doing push-ups, all type of crazy shit, just because, you know, it's like, it's like grinding. Like we used to, you used to have to sit outside all day you know what I mean? And it wouldn't be no cells coming through, it'd be dry. But the whole exercise was to sit outside the whole day mm -hmm. through all the changes, you know what I'm saying? And then you'll learn the, the pattern. Oh, it's a morning rush, it get dry, it's slow. Mm -hmm. you gonna, you gonna be uninspired around two o'clock probably. You know what I'm saying? Most likely you're gonna lose all your creativity around this time. If you start at this time, you're gonna run dry. You know what I'm saying? And just learning the, 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 you know what I'm saying? The pattern of what's going on mm -hmm. by just not leaving. 
and then you gain a deeper understanding. And it's an advantage, you know what I mean? So the same with the music, you know? Look, Reagan's so cold. Obama's so hope. Donald Trump spent his trust for money on the vote. I'm from a place where you probably can't go. Speaking for some people that you probably ain't know. It's pressure built up and it's probably gonna blow. And if we say go, then they probably gonna go. You went on social media a while back and you called out some, some DJs and some radio stations uh, for not supporting uh, a particular track. And you mm -hmm. were like, I did my job. It's on y'all to, to do the job. I'm curious, what what was the conversations like after that? Because I feel like we're in a moment now with what's going on with Donald Trump where it's like, I look at artists to to, to talk for the community. Mm -hmm. But then like, everybody's got to play their part. Like I put Power 106 up there mm -hmm. and I put the Atlanta radio station and the New York station. But you know, me and me and the DJs at Power, we actually had a convo on there about it. You know, and it was, it was dope. But my, my main thing was just like, first as an artist, we got to protest through our art. We make music. And then as DJs, I was just saying DJs should protest through their platform, which is DJing, whether it's in the club, in the radio station, in the backyard, whatever. Mm -hmm. If you're going to protest, that's the most effective way. And so that's what that post was just about. Like, you know, as artist YG, myself made a record, you know, and that's us doing our job as artists. If y'all, any DJs fell away, Y'all should, should protest by, you know, supporting the records that this message is, 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 is being touched on. Mm -hmm. And, you know, like I said, that's how I felt. And I, I feel like it was a valid point. Sure. You know what I mean? And, you know, I, I, I can't, you can't call people out and tell them how to do what they do. But that was more of a political thing than a, like a, a, a career thing. It wasn't about this my record and I want to get a spin. It's like the message, you know what I'm saying? This is a, this is a straightforward message that you know, y'all got the record already. You know, we done the work already. You know, get behind it, mm -hmm. and uh, you know, we had a good convo. One thing that I, that I also love about <laughs> that song in particular is you guys definitely give a lot of love to Latinos. And I don't see that enough in hip hop where it's like black and brown, we gotta support each other. It's right. like, it kind of reminded me of like, you know, when Pac was around, he was yeah. like kind of a unifying symbol. Right. Um, speak a little bit about why that was important to you. Yeah, I think, you know, as being an LA artist, we don't really have a Mexican voice in, the, in on the rap scene as loud as ours. So we like, you know, we ain't feel that, that message Trump was putting out there. Mm -hmm. So we like, we gonna speak, you know, on behalf of that issue also, you know what I'm saying? Because, you know, we relate in the struggle, you know what I'm saying? In poverty and then like not having shit, you know, we in being incarcerated, we relate, you know what I'm saying? So we don't feel that, you know what I mean? We don't feel that either, that message ain't something we feel neither. If it was a, a big Mexican rapper in LA, I'm sure that that would have been touched on, but just based on we got a platform, it was on us to, I think, touch on that too, in a fuck Donald Trump record, you know what I'm saying? That's one of the main messages that was like, you crazy, bro, you going a little too far. Hold up, nip, tell the world how you fuck with Mexicans. It wouldn't be the USA without Mexicans, and if it's time to team up, shit, let's begin. Black love, brown pride, and assess again. You also said in an interview that tech and hip hop are very connected. Definitely. Can you uh, can you share some of those parallels for, for people who might not like tech and hip hop? Like, how is that connected? In so many ways. Um, Apple Music, you know, the number one streaming genre is hip hop. Spotify, um, you know, Beats by Dre. Um, any one of these billion dollar platforms, a lot of the value comes from the people of influence that utilize the platform. And those people are never involved in the business. You know what I'm saying? But they, 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 attention that they garner is being leveraged. You know what I'm saying? And I sat next to the owner of um, Tinder at the Laker game. And he told me the business model of how you evaluate a, um, a app. And he told me, an equation that's basically there's a certain dollar amount for every user on an app. If you want to go sell your app, if you got 10 users, there's a certain number, dollar amount, the value of your company 
is based on users times this dollar amount. And so when you got 10 million followers on Twitter, the value of Twitter is a certain dollar amount times your 10 million users plus the other 10 million plus the other 2 million plus the other. So when Twitter goes to get evaluated at so and so billion, mm -hmm. the model is a is an eyeball monetization, attention monetization model. And who's the reason that they are paying attention? The celebrity, the artist, you know what I'm saying? But for us, it's like a marketing tool to stay in contact with your fans. Yeah, that's cool. But to y'all, y'all in a whole different business. Y'all in a uh, advertisement attention model. And it's, it's, you know, you leveraging all of these followers for the day you sell your company. So it's, we are very valuable in the tech world. You know what I'm saying? Because we have influence. And it, these is attention models and, and, and advertisement models, you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So, you know what I mean? Um, that's one of the ways. For sure. I think it's important for, for our community to realize our power in that. It's like all these brands want to pay us money to sell their brands. Mm -hmm. It's like we need to use that to, to sell our own shit too. 100%. Same way Puff selling vodka mm -hmm. and, and you know what I mean? Jay selling Ace of Spades and we got to go on the tech and sell something too. You know what I mean? That we own. So, you know, I think that it's coming. I think, you know, Dr. Dre was one of the first ones in, in that in that space with the with the streaming service that turned into Apple Music. Mm -hmm. And then obviously the hardware too, the headphones. But yeah, man, I think that it's necessary. I saw you posted on, on Twitter about me getting sent back to, to jail. Yeah. You retweeted that. Do you have any, any words for, for that situation and how that's reflective of the the justice or unjustice system? Probation, man. You know what I mean? I, they, it's like you got a tail on you. And they can snatch your tail anytime they want to. You don't even have to break a law to violate probation. That's some bullshit. You know what I'm saying? That is, it's like, that's bullshit. And that's not even common sense. I've been on probation for a long time. I got free at last when I got off probation. I tatted that on my thumb. Mm. You know what I'm saying? I was on probation from 18 to 25. So I know how that feel and having a career and you know what I mean? But to give them two, two to four years, come on, man. Just the whole probation shit. That's a whole nother argument. You know what I'm saying? How that work. That's some tricky shit. That's some real bullshit for real. A lot of times you'd rather stay in jail. Mm. When you really think about it, you'd have done better by staying in jail instead of taking a probation. Cause now they violating you every two years, every year. And it stretch you out to where you paying money. You checking in every month. That's stressful. Having a PO, come on, man, that's bullshit. You know what I'm saying? Restricting your travel, it's bullshit. Police pull you over, they got full, you don't got rights. Nah, you know, so I feel for Meek, man, but I feel like, you know, <clears throat> everything happened for a reason. And Meek been through this, so he kind of, he bounced back stronger last time he got out, you know what I'm saying? So everything will pan out, but I felt for this one. I'm like, man, nah, that one hurt me. Looking at this, like, come on, man. Let a nigga live, you know what I'm saying? But free Meek Millie, man. Any uh, any last words? What's left to accomplish? A lot, man. I feel like um, I haven't flexed musically. I've been making music with a handicap, man. You know what I'm saying? I ain't never complaining about it, but you know, this is my first project that's mixed and mastered hmm. that I ever put out. You know, none of my shit been mixed and I tore it off of it internationally. You know what I'm saying? But like a lot of shit, man. It's like, I wanna, I wanna really, just delivering the music space more than I have. You know, because again, like, don't get me wrong, I've done some dope shit, but I know I know what I got in me, and I'm, I'm very, 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 very untapped, my, my reservoir, you know what I'm saying? And I really wanna have a, I got the space now to really just be an artist. This was really important to get my business set up the way I wanted it to be, mm -hmm. but now I could really like, um, just do a music flex, you know what I'm saying? And be an artist and, and like express my opinion in the music space primarily for the next few years, you know what I mean? So that's my focus is just really, really flex as an artist. Everything else on autopilot, I got a great team. The business is great, you know what I'm saying? And the better the music, the better everything.